Well, good morning, everybody. It's great that we have a youth service this morning, and obviously they got somebody really young to come and preach. Thank you for laughing. That was a joke, obviously. Uh, but we were reminded before that it doesn't matter if you are young or old, and I actually want to echo that this morning because this is what partly our passage is, passage is about today. And so particularly for you young people, you might kind of think, oh, this comes the boring bit. No, this is actually the really important bit, all right? And so just to kind of get us all involved, if you are age zero to five, please put up your hand. Well done, Kathy, zero to five, that's good. If you're kind of five to 10, put up your hand. All right, we need to speed this up a little bit. 10 to 20, a few there, 20 to... 50, 52, yeah, are you 52? Anyway, no, I just 52, I just wanted to, you know, be important, just, I might be 52, anyway, um, 50 to 80, 80 to 100, there's a hand up the back there, over 100, actually online, this is for everyone, okay? And I really want to encourage you, particularly young people, this word this morning is for you as well as everyone else, okay? And we'll actually see partly from the reading today that God can do amazing things through young people too. So I want to encourage you in that. So if you've got a Bible, please have it open because it is far more important than what I've got to say. But uh, yeah, please hang in there with us, all right? So 2020 might have seemed a longer year than most for some of us. From, you might remember, and it seemed such a long time ago, way back at the beginning of the year, we had bushfires. And then there was, of course, because of, through that smoke. And then there was even floods. And of course, the coronavirus. With its lockdowns, homeschooling, who enjoyed homeschooling? No, I don't think anyone really enjoyed that. There was some loss of work for some, and so on. It's been an interesting year. What an understatement that is. But if nothing else, this year has reminded us again and again of our mortality, lack of control, and of living in a broken world. And when we look back at all those things, we long for, we cry out for hope, love, joy, and peace. In other words, we long for what God did for us through the birth of Jesus. And Christmas is a time when, of course, we remember the birth of our Saviour. Now, kids, you might, I'm sure you know, right, that Christmas is only a few weeks away. And what a great time of year that is. And I wonder if just in your mind you think, oh, what excites you the most about Christmas? It might be family and for the adults, catching up with family, that's what might be the exciting bit. Presents, we all look forward to presents, right? Or for holidays, I'm you know, really looking forward to holidays. I'm exhausted, and I'm sure many of you are as well. But more than all those things, Christmas is a great time to reflect upon the age-old questions of who am I and why am I here? but not to reflect upon those things through the world's eyes, but through God's eyes. What does God say about who we are and why we're here? And we should be excited about Christmas, yes, but not for the things that we get, but for what God has done for us. Because at Christmas, God changed the world and God changed our lives. And Christmas should be a reminder that we are waiting and watching longing, looking for the return of Jesus. And Christmas is a reminder for us that one day all things will be renewed. I actually read a quote the other day from Eugene Peterson. If you don't know him, he's the guy that wrote the, wrote the message version of the Bible. And he said, a person has to get fed up with the ways of the world before they acquire a longing for the world of grace. And he said, if we let it, 2020 can increase our appetite for the kingdom of God and for the awaited return of Jesus. 
Because as Christians, we live in persistent patience with eager expectation. And what I mean by that is persistent patience in the gift of Jesus through the everyday. Eager expectation in what God has promised he will do in the future. And what we're going to do this morning is see that. We're going to think about Christmas and what it means for us in all those things through the eyes of Mary. But before we do that, we need to ask God to help us as we do that. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've brought us here together this morning, young and old alike. And we thank you, Father, that this message, these words that we are going through this morning from Mary are for each and every one of us. And we just ask, Lord, that you might open our eyes to see it, open our hearts to receive it, and bend our wills, Father, that we might obey it with your strength and to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So to begin with, who was Mary? Well, she was obviously a person who lived in persistent patience as well with eager expectation. Why? Well, we need to remember the situation that Mary lived in, a situation actually that is not too unlike our own. Of course, there are many differences, but there's many similarities as well. Because Mary lived in a world that had not heard from God for 400 years. The last word from God was way back in the days of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. And some may have thought in that time, as some people think today, that God has forgotten all about them. We haven't heard from God for so long. But some, even way back then, were still waiting and looking. Elizabeth and Mary, for a start. If you have a look with me in verse 45, it simply says that Mary believed when the only thing she had to go on was the word of God. And so it is for us as well. Mary lived patiently awaiting the promised saviour. She was eagerly waiting for the one to come. As are we, are we not? We eagerly await the return of Jesus and we live in the light of that. We can tell by the reaction Mary had to the me message given to her that she would have a baby, even though she wasn't married. And what do we know about Mary? Well, as I said, we know she wasn't married, that she was quite young, and I've read in many commentaries she was probably not over 15, and that she was a nobody, really. And that might be some of us in the room. So again, if you are young, be encouraged that God can do incredible things through you like he did for Mary. You might feel like a nobody. God can do incredible things through you as well. So again, this message is for each and every one of us in this room this morning. So how does Mary respond when the angel comes to her and says, you are going to have a baby in verse 31? As Mary say, oh, don't be silly, there's no way that can happen. No. She says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And what incredible faith that is. What great trust that God can do anything. And that's a challenge for us as well, isn't it? Trusting that God can do anything, no matter how young, no matter how old no matter anything. Who am I? Well, <laughs> I am no one, really. But God can do a whole lot through those that know that God can do anything and are willing to trust in him. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And in that regard, I wonder what promises you live by. We had some memory verses there before. Perhaps that's something that you try to remember each and every day to encourage you in your walk before God. Perhaps there are other verses, like 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, which say, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead 
to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Or perhaps another promise you live by each and every day is Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Or perhaps for you, the verse that you try and remember in your walk before God each and every day is Romans chapter 8, verse 18. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What an incredible promise that is to remember, particularly this year, I think, with its difficulties and troubles and turmoils. And those verses remind us that it is about living in continued patience, looking for what God is going to do. And as a confirmation of what God can do, the angel also says to Mary and tells her about her relative Elizabeth, who was unable to have a baby, but who was now pregnant in her old age. And that being the case, Mary goes and visits her. And when Mary meets Elizabeth, the baby within her jumps for joy. But did you notice that Elizabeth, even in her old age, knew about Mary already? How could she know that? Only by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's how she's able to speak in this way. God is here about to change the course of all human history. The most important period in all of time is about to begin through the birth of Jesus. And where is God? Occupying himself with two obscure women, one old and barren, the other young and unmarried. And Mary is so moved by this vision of God that she breaks out in this song that we're looking at this morning. But notice here as well as we look at this song, in Mary's words, it's, it's not about Mary. It's about what God is going to do. It's a song of God's mercy. And the song begins with Mary's expression of what she feels in her heart in verses 46 and 47, if you have a look there. And that expression is one of incredible joy that she shares. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. And that's where our hearts should be as well, shouldn't they? Because that's the great mark of the followers of Jesus, is joy in the Holy Spirit. And the great mark of that joy is to make as much as, make as, much as possible of God. So boys and girls, how is God glorified? Well, for everyone, of course, not just boys and girls, but for each and every one of us, God is glorified when we rejoice in him. And then Mary talks about what God has done specifically for her as an individual in verses 48 and 49, if you have a look at it. And that is that God has regarded her lowliness. Sometimes if you're young, you might think, oh, I'm a nobody, I can't do anything. But God did great things for Mary. And here Mary expresses an example of the way God is. And then she spends most of the time describing the way God is in general. God's character shows itself and it shows why he has treated, the way, treated Mary the way he has. And that leads Mary to rejoice and give thanks to God. But let's not forget as well, we actually need to go back a little bit further than that in the book of Luke and see that these words are actually recorded for a guy called Theophilus. There's a great name, isn't it? Imagine being called Theophilus. And so there's a warning here for him and therefore for us not to make the common mistake that because God is great, he leans towards great people. Or because God is exalted, he leans towards those who are exalted among people. But just the opposite is actually the case. God's holiness has expressed itself and will continue to express itself by bringing up the lowly and bringing down the proud. 
Actually, Luke addresses his writing here to the most excellent Theophilus. And John Piper makes the point that it is a dangerous thing to be a most excellent anything. John Piper says, locked down, secure, unchangeable knowledge as a way of troubling the rich and the powerful. Because you can't buy truth with your riches. You can't control it with your power. And what gives Mary joy is that God loves to lift up the underdog who calls on his mercy. And Mary talks about this three times, actually, if you have a look at it there. In verse 50, God has mercy on those who fear him. And in verse 52, he has exalted those of low degree. Verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things. And that's one aspect of God's character. But on the other side, God opposes the proud. And Mary talks about that three times in her song as well, if you have a look in verse 51. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. And then verse 52, he has put down the mighty from their thrones. Verse 53, the rich he has sent away empty. The Bible is clear that God does not favour the rich. He does not favour the powerful or the proud. How could God favour those things when in the world they are so often the things that take the place of God rather than point to him? So Mary's song here is recorded not just for interest, but there's a word of warning here. But there, of course, is also a picture of salvation Theophilus, please look at what God is really like. He is not impressed by your, proud, by your pride or your power or your wealth. God has mercy on those who fear him, who humble themselves and turn away from the ways of the world to self-denial for the sake of others. It's all about what God, it's all about God. It's all about what God has done, is doing, and will do. So how do we respond? Because we need to respond to this, don't we? Each and every one of us, again, young, old, in between. We need to respond to what God is saying to us in these words. And we can do that by being patient, living God's way, and eagerly looking for what God will do in the return of Jesus. So to summarise, 2020 has been a difficult year. I actually said at the 8.30 service, it's probably been a year like no other, but some people did point out to me some years that have been similar in the past. So I've changed that a little bit. 2020 has been a difficult year, and I think we'd all agree with that. But if nothing else, 2020 has brought into clear focus for us that we will not be on this earth forever. 2020 has shaken idols. It has made us uncomfortable and shown clearly the broken world that we live in. But as 2020 does come to an end, Christmas reminds us that God has not left his creation or his people. And boys and girls, adults, there are lots of reasons to be excited about Christmas. Christmas is a wonderful time. But we need to remember the most important thing that we can remember about Christmas. And Christmas should remind us that we do live with ongoing patience in God's love, looking to the return of Jesus. Let's pray as we remember that. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this word to us this morning and the truth that it reminds us of. Father, we do pray that you might help us as we do look to Christmas, that, Father, you might remind us and help us to remember 
that greatest gift that you gave of yourself to us, that you took, that you took our place and bore the punishment that we deserve. And Lord, we pray that you, we might accept that gift of your forgiveness for us and that we might live because of it, speaking, thinking and act, acting rightly for you and bringing glory to your name. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.